Very good. Thank you. Our topic today takes a look, as you're well aware, at Minsure. We have invited three people with very different perspectives to present their views on several questions we will be asking. Our first panelist is Scott Lights, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Minsure. Scott has served as Chief Executive Officer since December of 2013. He brings 20 years of experience in the healthcare and public health sectors to the role. Mr. Lights comes to this role from the Minnesota Department of Human Services, where he was an assistant commissioner responsible for overseeing and managing the state's Medicaid program. While there, he spearheaded the reform of the state's managed care and procurement processes, implemented accountable payment and health care delivery models in Medicaid, and implemented the Affordable Care Act. Mr. Lights, would you join us up here, please? Thank you. Danette Coleman, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Individual and Family Business with Medica. Danette is responsible for all aspects of the individual business segment, both financial and operational. She has more than 20 years of healthcare experience and is highly regarded for her knowledge of the healthcare industry. Previously at Medica, Ms. Coleman was Vice President of Public Policy a role in which she worked on major legislative issues, including the Affordable Care Act. She has been appointed to participate in numerous health policy advisory boards, including most recently the Minnesota Exchange Advisory Task Force. So we welcome Ms. Coleman to our panel. <laughs> Stephen Parente, Ph.D., is the Minnesota Insurance Industry Chair of Health Finance in the Carlson School of Management and the Director of the Medical Industry Leadership Institute at the University of Minnesota. As a professor in the Finance Department, he specializes in health economics, health information technology, and health insurance. Dr. Parente is the Governing Chair of the Health Care Cost Institute. So we welcome Mr. Parente to our panel. I have got enough questions to last us all day. But seeing as how we always try to get out of here at 9, I will jump right into this. We want to cover a couple broad topics on Minsure today. The first is the technology aspect. So this first question I'll present to Mr. Lights. Minsure recently announced the selection of Deloitte as its new general contractor. What are the short-term items Deloitte is working on, and how will it translate to improvements in Minsure? Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, we um, did recently announce that uh, we have brought on uh, Deloitte as our general contractor for Minsure, and what their responsibility will really be will be to oversee um, the, the on-the-ground coding vendors to ensure that we're uh, improving the Minsure system and that we're <clears throat> thinking about what the future needs to look like. Um, one of the challenges that I think states that built exchanges faced was, um, I would say, um, stepping back and looking in retrospect, um, a general lack of understanding of the absurd complexity that was going to be there in building exchanges. And um, one of the things that I've tried to acknowledge since coming on to Minsure is that we really need to step back and do some assessment of where we're at with the system. We brought in um, Optum Consulting back in um, January to take a look at where Minsure was at. One of the things that they recommended is that we bring on an overseer, a general contractor, as they called it, a single ringable neck that you can assure is going to help to drive improvements in the system. And so Deloitte's going to really initially be looking at two things with regards to Minsure. The first is, um, is the system that we have right now a sustainable one and one that can actually be built on and improved into the future? It's sort of a threshold question for us. Um, they're going to be um, bringing back some recommendations to us over the course of the next 30 days around that issue of, okay, here's what you have in terms of technology on the ground right now. Here's our assessment of the technology that you have. Um, is it fixable? Uh, can you build on it and improve on it? Or is it simply at a state where it's not good enough to move forward with? And we're open to all three of those, uh, th those options, and I think Deloitte's going to help us think through those issues. 
But the second thing is we're driving now towards November, which is when the open enrollment period starts um, for 2015 coverage. It runs from November through uh, 15th through February 15th um, of 2015. Um, the system that we have in place is likely to be the system that we'll have for that open enrollment period. So the th second thing that Deloitte's really helping us look at is what improvements in the short run do we need to make to make the customer experience uh, a much better one uh, for 2015 than it was for 2014. Um, perhaps you've heard that the customer experience was not as good as it could have been in the fall of uh, 2013 when the system rolled out. It improved a fair amount by the time we ended open enrollment in March, but we also have know that there's a lot of things that need to be improved both on the consumer side and as Danette will likely note, a lot on the back end processes that we have and how we transfer data to the health plans and how cust uh, counties, uh, bro agents and brokers, navigators work with our system. A lot of improvements need to be made there. And so Delight's gonna be helping us think through those issues. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Parente. You have shared concerns of data privacy and security for quite some time and testified in front of Congress on these issues. One, have your concerns been addressed? And if not, will Deloitte help to limit or eliminate your concerns by this fall's open enrollment period? Well, thanks again for the opportunity to speak and, and thanks for being the, maybe the one or two people that actually saw that tweet back, if I'm back, <laughs> back in the fall about privacy. Um, the, um, I guess the short answer is that uh, the, the privacy issue is an ongoing affair. Uh, there are a lot of things that are still in process. Uh, one of the concerns that I had when voicing privacy uh, was really the back office components and how industrial strength the back office components will be, not just for Minsure, but for the entire country in terms of how these systems have to operate. Uh, I understand that this, the state's uh, role uh, I think is, is a good thing to do for a laboratory, but it's also, um, it was a political decision made by Congress in 2009 to have the states play an active role rather than the federal government run the exchanges in their entirety. Uh, and you might say, well, that's, that's the way the Democrats wanted to do it, but the reality is that when the closest equivalent to these exchanges was um, the Bush administration's uh, push for Part D coverage in 2003 and 2004, and ultimately in 2006, the Part D Medicare Advantage uh, website was a giant federal exchange for Medicare plans that did not have really a state component. It had state pieces being contributed, but the technology was entirely housed by the feds. And the, the, my concern about privacy is that there's a lot of handoffs that are going on between many different parties uh, that need to be addressed. To answer your question about whether Deloitte will take care of it or not, uh, they could provide some oversight, but um, it depends on how long that oversight is going to be. And the point of trust can be broken not just in Minnesota, but all the way back to the federal government through the different data portals that have to connect in back office. And I'll add that that back office isn't built. Uh, mm -hmm. Accenture got a huge chunk of money uh, without a bid, uh, over $100 million in March to have it effectively done by April. It's not done, and they're talking about having it done by September. And in the meantime, the feds are basically airdropping money to Medica and everybody else just to make sure that they can keep the subsidy part of it's actually running. So in terms of a seamless integrated proje project with no pro possibilities of privacy or fraud, we're not there. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Ms. Coleman, your company operates in several states in the upper Midwest, including Minnesota. Can you compare and contrast the experience Medica has had with Minsure versus the federal exchange in Wisconsin, for example. Um, so, yeah, so thank you uh, for having us here. It's very interesting to be sitting on the panel instead of where Mike is. I kind of like it. <laughs> so um, I think we are. We are on uh, the federal exchange in bo both North Dakota and Wisconsin, and we are on uh, Minsure here in, in Minnesota. Um, the experiences have been very different. Um, I would say, actually, in the beginning, and early on, we had a lot more confidence in what we were doing in, in Minnesota and the ability to get that moving and, and off the ground. Um, as, as we got closer, as Scott alluded to, it became clear that the technology, that there were going to be significant challenges at the federal level as well as, as at the state level. What, what I will say with, with Minsure and why uh, Medica took the position that we really wanted Me Minnesota to have a, a state-based exchange was the ability 
somebody doesn't agree with that, but <laughs> was the ability to work very closely. You know, if we have an issue with the federal exchange, it's really difficult to talk to the right people to get that resolved. It's very difficult when you have a member who calls you and they're through the federal exchange and they had an issue with, with their enrollment and they're saying, well, they said a supervisor would call me back in seven to 12 days. That makes it really difficult for the plan and there's no place for us to call. With the state exchange, you know, we really are working day to day. I would say, um, you know, with the, the change in, in leadership in Minsure, we have transparency there that, that was much more challenging and difficult uh, in the earlier days. Uh, the plans and, and um, Minsure work, uh, you know, have meetings uh, constantly trying to figure out how we're going to make this the best experience for the consumer because when it comes down to it, that's what's really the most critical piece. Um, there are some things, though, that we're working closely with Minsure that are very challenging for the carriers right now. Um, for life events, so if, you know, open enrollment period is over, but if certain things happen, you lose your employer-sponsored coverage, you have a baby, you get married, you can come on to the system. Right now, Minsure doesn't have a way to capture that information, to collect that information, to hold that information, so the plans are doing that. That is really complicated when somebody is eligible for a subsidy, and you're trying to figure out the source of truth and how that impacts the subsidy. Um, and to Stephen's point as well, I wouldn't say money is being airdropped into the health plans, but um, we are having to do a lot. <laughs> it, there's no drones flying over, you know, our, our office. But, um, but there's a lot of work that's going to happen from a reconciliation standpoint. And I will tell you from, from the CFO to our controller, it is very uncomfortable right now trying to figure out the accounting of all of this. And so there, there's, there's absolutely significant challenges that, that um, I, I'd say we're a third of the way of, of where we need to, to get on this. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're moving on to a little different part of it, and that concerns small businesses. And again, we'll go in the same order this round. Uh, Scott Lights then. Regarding the shop exchange, which of course is the part of Minsure that serves small employees, it is not a fully automated online system. Employees cannot go online to select their health plan, and many of the back-end systems are still manual. How long do you believe it will take to get this system fully automated, and will it be fully automated by this fall? So for anyone who has tried to sort of do the shop portion of this, um, I think the way it was just described is accurate. Um, it has been one of the slower pieces of Minsure to come up. I think one of the questions that um, the state faces and Minsure faces in this, in this area is, Given um, the relatively small enrollment that's happened through SHOP, if you think about where the federal government and, and many states are, they simply chose to delay doing SHOP for a while because it was going to compete with priorities um, that were already on the ground. Um, and what I think um, decisions that were made at the federal level were really to think about, well, what, what pieces really need to happen first and what pieces would, be, would we like to have as we move forward over the, over the next several years? And a decision was made there to say, the most important piece out of the gate is really getting individual enrollment up and running and, 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 and working well. Um, and then thinking about how we phase in things like uh, small business enrollment over time. Um, I think we, we, we're at a point in Minnesota where I think we're, we're going to have to make a decision around this uh, particular issue. Do we continue to try to build out shop so it is available for the fall, or do we think about many of the fixes that we need to make um, for follow-up enrollment on the individual side, uh, acknowledge that shop is something we would like to have moving forward, but that we may wish to uh, focus resources somewhere else in the, in the short run to get those pieces fixed, up and running, more stable, and then think about how we build forward from there. We're not at that point of decision yet, so I can't directly answer the question as to whether shop will be open and, 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 and more automated for the fall, because I think we have in the next uh, several weeks some, some uh, decisions to make around whether shop should be something we build towards for the fall, or whether we simply want to acknowledge that's a piece that we'd like to have. It's one we'd like to have in the next year or so, um, but we need to focus resources uh, differently right now. And so I don't have an answer for that, but I think um, moving forward, it's something we would like to obviously improve and make much more automated. It simply competes with other things that um, I think others would like to have as well, um, you know, ability for agents and brokers to more directly tap into the system and, and enroll individuals, other types of things. When we, uh, I'll just close with this on, on this particular question. When we look at where our, um, uh, where we devote our resources right now within Minsure. When we met with the Board of Directors last week, we 
uh, went through an exercise with them that talked about um, three buckets of things that we'd like to do. Fixes that need to occur to the current system of functionality that should be there but simply is not as good as it should be. Um, the second bucket being things that we need to have for follow-up and enrollment of individuals. And the third bucket of things that are nice to have. Um, and right now, <clears throat> that third bucket is awfully darn small compared to where resources need to go. The other two are where we really need to focus in, in the short run, which is getting functionality there that should be there and getting things ready for follow-up and enrollment. Okay, thank you. Dr. Parente, once the shop system is fully operational, how long will it take for small employers to view it as a viable option for health insurance coverage? In other words, is there some brand building that needs to happen in the small business community, and how long may that take? See, I'm, I'm a finance professor, not a marketing professor, <laughs> but uh, I'll try to channel them. Obviously, I'm going to always do that. <laughs> um, so I think that um, actually the, the shop or the small business model is going to be in, in danger because it didn't come up originally. There's tax credits attached to it that make it more challenging because it didn't come up originally. And this is not just Minnesota, it's nationally. Uh, there's also been a, a lack of clarity from the feds on getting the regulations nailed down exactly what small business would look like and how the benefit, even things like where the deductible limits would actually be in the end weren't determined until very recently. Uh, so what, what concerns me is that the individual insurance market might be for small employers where they turn because uh, shop isn't, is still, you know, under development. And so that by the time it's all there, uh, there might be already an exodus that already occurred to other sources to get people's coverage uh, because, you know, in theory, the individual mandate still holds. And if, the, if it's not clear to small employers how to get this thing done, and those small employers want to keep things operational and they have contracts and payroll to make, they're going to basically, you know, have a nice conversation with their employees and say, you know, you might want to go think about the exchange. It's available here in a way it hasn't been before. There's a lot of small employers that are service industry folks anyway where the employers can't afford the premiums even after the credits are actually applied. So I can imagine a world in five or six years where we're not even talking about the small ins group insurance market anymore. It might become an artifact of ACA that there's credit still applied, but the individual insurance market might have swarmed it and, uh, and moved differently. I know actuarially they're priced the same fairly pretty much most, for the most part anyway. Thank you. That's a nice segue into the question for Danette. Even if Minsure works to build its brand among small employers, is there a ceiling in terms of its success? In other words, to what extent will small employers go online to offer their coverage versus working with an insurance agent or broker? Yeah, I, I think that's the, the, the right place to start talking about shop. I, I think there's, the question is, what is the value to a small employer to, to go into shop? And if you think about what the ACA was trying to accomplish with the individual market, was this whole idea of if you're, if you're going to tell carriers they can't underwrite people any longer, they have to accept all comers, then you need a mandate. You need everybody in the pool in, in order for that to work. In order for that to work, you need to have subsidies um, because help, people are going to need help paying for, for, for coverage. And so the idea of the exchange is you can kind of facilitate all of those things. Ideally, if it's, if it's operating as it's intended to work, all of those things exist. In the shop, and, and so the real incentive for an individual in, in the exchange is it's the only place you can get subsidies. So that, that's a big incentive for somebody who's eligible for a subsidy. For the small employers, um, there's, there's tax credits, uh, as Stephen referenced, but the, the, it's, it's kind of threading the needle to, you know, to, to get those tax credits. They're not broadly uh, available. Very few employers qualify for them. And so then you have to start thinking about, okay, then what is the value um, of SHOP? And I think there's been many surveys that have done small employers, the most important person to their decision making is their broker. That that is a relationship that, that is very, uh, very critical, trusting. And right now the broker can't really assist the, the small employer through the process with SHOP. So I, I guess what, what, what I would put out there is I, I agree with Stephen. I, I really think the idea of the SHOP was kind of a last minute ad. Uh, to, to the ACA. I think it's a disruption, uh, a distraction uh, to what it is that really needs to be done. And I, I just think going forward, I think you're going to see the shop kind of dwindle 
and go away. And I would predict, I don't think the feds will even implement um, ultimately uh, the shop. So I, I think small employers will continue to work with the broker. Now what's interesting is there are a lot of things going on in the private market around exchange like um, uh, platforms that the private market is using. So it appears that the private market for employers is really stepping up and kind of filling that. So whether or not we see state or federal exchanges uh, step in, I, I think is still in doubt. Very good, thank you much. Next questions concern rates of the program. We'll start with Dr. Parente. Mincher has been touting that Minnesota has the lowest health insurance premiums in the nation for the individual health insurance market. One, is that sustainable? And two, can these people expect large increases in their health insurance premiums next year? Uh, you know, you really need to do this at a bar. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, the, the premiums are lowest in the nation. We can basically be happy about that. We are, healthcare expenditures are also fairly low too, um, but they're not that extremely low. Um, what concerns me is um, a behavior I saw, and actually research I did 10, 12 years ago, I was telling Danette about this at breakfast, where um, the uh, large corporations uh, through the Hewitt uh, actually set up their own HMO auction. Actually, Scott and I talked about this years ago too. Uh, where for three years running, uh, essentially Hewitt operated an, a national exchange where they invited uh, PepsiCo, uh, Boeing, Lockheed, a variety of major firms to come in and essentially um, bid, sealed bid auctions essentially on providing health benefits. This occurred from 2000 to 2002. And what occurred, uh, to cut to the chase, was that Blue Cross Blue Shield nationally uh, panicked in the bidding process. This thing actually operated like eBay, but it was a sort of a negative auction. And they bid really low. And they bid so low that they got a ton of business. And the next year, they uh, actuarially, they were nearly destroyed. Um, and the, keep in mind now, blue, in the large group market, the for the most part, an insurer does not accept the risk. Uh, the actual employer accepts the risk. And so there was just a lot of blowback that occurred to the employer because of just the way the premium structures are set. But it got to a point where within two to three years, um, to make sure that no disasters like that ever occurred, there was tremendous collusion amongst the plans. Not to say that would ever happen here, uh, but to the point where Hewitt and the employers jointly decided that this is ridiculous, let's stop it. Because it's, it's actually adding make work, as, as cool as the concept tended to be. My concern looking at what happened in Minnesota is that one or two of the plans might have tried this same issue. They put a sealed bid in, they went in low. Um, the concern I have further is that it may not be necessarily that much to their disadvantage if the feds through the different reinsurance um, and risk corridor mechanisms actually are partly, this, the plan may be made whole. I'm just curious to see what Danette thinks about this in terms of whether or not they have extraordinary costs they didn't necessarily expect and the feds will compensate within a certain area uh, uh, some of that money that's actually there. Um, <clears throat> I think if the feds were to compensate uh, plans for taking on unnecessary risk, this next year is going to be the year because this is in a rollout period. And the reality is the accounting systems, as we talked about previously, are not set in place. So you can be kind of, you know, approximate in terms of how much money you would like to give the plans if someone made an egregious error. But it's, it's nice that we got the, the press. We'll just have to see actuarially whether it comes out that same way, and we won't know that until open enrollment next year to see where the premiums fall in. Okay, thank you. Next question. Well, we'll go to Danette, unless you wanted to say something. Then. Oh, I have lots of things. Okay. <laughs> A little bit, little different twist I'll work it into this. whatever you ask me. I figured that, I figured that. <laughs> the Minnesota Department of Commerce has not yet announced if it will allow small employers to keep their health insurance coverage that does not comply with many elements of the Affordable Care Act. If the department allows small businesses to keep these old plans, it would benefit small businesses with relatively healthy employers, employees and have a negative impact on small businesses with less healthy employees. So what are the ramifications for small employers either way and what do you believe the department will ultimately decide? 
I'm going to answer the other I question. <laughs> because, um, this is a really complicated issue. So let me kind of at a really high level try to uh, put some context around it. So um, recall that back before the ACA passed, the president came out and said, if you like your health plan, you can keep it. And, and at the time, lobbying where I was interacting with a lot of people in the federal government, I, I talked to st staffers after that who said, what the heck does that mean? What, how do we make that work? And so they kind of came up, at, at the time they came up with um, grandfathered policies. And it really applied more in the individual market because it was really tough to, to grandfather an employer policy because basically you couldn't make very few changes to your benefit design, cost sharing, all of that, and it was no longer grandfathered. And for three plus years, that, that just wasn't very realistic. So what happened as we got into the open enrollment, things weren't going as they intended. There was a lot of noise across the country, people saying, my plan is getting canceled. My plan is getting canceled, and I like the plan that I have. Well, so the president came out and said, in, in, a, in, in a press conference that I remember the, you know, at the plans, we're sitting there watching on TV, he says what he says, and we all went, what does that mean? So, so basically what it said was he left it up to the states to decide whether or not employers and individuals could keep the coverage that they had for a certain amount of time. They went into a different risk pool, which really screws up the three R's. Um, very complicated. Minnesota took the position at that time to say no. In Minnesota, we have guaranteed renewability for the individual market, and so your plan, your plan might have been changed, but it wasn't canceled. And so, no, we're, we're not going to do this. We also operate in North Dakota, Wisconsin, and North Dakota, Wisconsin said, yes, they can keep their plan, and so we had to deal with that there. The question, though, with small employers is, you know, keep in mind that in the small employer market, the way that pricing used to work is about 50% of your premium is set on your individual group's experience, and about 50% of it is set on the entire pool of that carrier small group business. And when the law changed with the ACA, it said, no, all your, your rate is based entirely on the risk of that carrier's entire pool. So if you're a sick group, if you will, um, then when they go to community rating, you benefit from that. If you're a healthy group and you are paying a lower premium, um, now you've got to go to community rating, your rates are going up. So it's kind of a zero-sum game, but there's winners and there's losers. And so the question that was put out there that Minnesota Department of Commerce has not made a decision on is whether or not some small groups change their effective date to let's say a 12-1-13 before ACA went in place to keep their rates for, it continued on for another year. Some employers went to a 1-1-14 because they wanted community rating. And so the question is now, can those groups that made those changes, or those that went to the 12-1 to avoid the ACA, the community rating, can they stay there or not? And Commerce has not made a decision on that, and I think um, you know, the, the decision of not making a decision is saying no, because the states have to proactively uh, say that. So I, I, I don't, quite honestly, I don't know that commerce will make a decision. It's, it's, any decision would be controversial, so staying quiet is, is easier. Um, that's, that would be my guess. Okay. Thank you much. Mr. Lights, Minshore Board Chairman Brian Butner has publicly supported the release of health insurance premiums in advance of this fall's open enrollment period. If there was a value to consumers to release premiums before open enrollment in 2013, wouldn't there also be value in releasing them before open enrollment this fall? In other words, do you agree with Mr. Butner? Can, can I answer Danette's question? <laughs> I'll answer that. <laughs> um, you can answer both. Okay, well, that's, that's, I'm not going to do that. That is too hard. Um, so my, my board chair did say that um, in, a, in a, a legislative oversight committee hearing when, when, posed, when the question was posed. Um, and I, um, I certainly respect the views of my board chair. Um, uh, it's, the decision around when r rates are released are actually one, <laughs> this is for, fortunately I have a regulator that I can kick this to, is one that, that are made by the Department of Commerce. And so it's really a question of theirs. I, from, from our perspective as Minsure, we're, we're, I view us as a marketplace um, where coverage can be made available. Um, the pieces around when rates are released are really ones that will need to be decided by, by the Department of Commerce. Um, and so uh, I'll just leave it at that probably. <laughs> okay, fair enough. We'll get into a little different area, and that concerns open enrollment period. 
Uh, Mr. Lights, you had already mentioned that the next open enrollment period is November 15th through February 15th. Uh, so now that the open enrollment period has ended, how can people qualify for health insurance coverage from now until the beginning of this open enrollment period? Well, well let's start with Scott on that one too. Um, so there's a few ways that folks can get into coverage um, after the open enrollment period. The end of the open enrollment period was really the uh, enrollment period for people enrolling in qualified health plans through MNsure. Um, or outside of Minsure, um, for that matter. Um, the way that folks can continue to have coverage, first of all, coverage doesn't end for folks um, who have Minnesota Care, which is Minnesota's basic health plan option, which runs for people who have incomes between 133 and 200% of poverty. They can enroll throughout the year. It's a premium-based program, uh, been around for about 20 years. Uh, or Medicaid um, for folks um, kids up to 275 of poverty, uh, adults up to 133 of poverty, they can enroll in that year round. Um, Danette already mentioned um, uh, life events that folks, life change, the situations where a baby uh, might um, come into the world, uh, someone loses a job. Those individuals can enroll through MNsure. Uh, Danette also correctly noted that that's a messy system right now. I don't think there's any other way of saying that. Uh, the system that we have in place doesn't automatically handle that, and so there's a lot of manual work with the carriers and at Minsure and, and Department of Human Services to make sure that those enrollments can occur. And if you're a member of a federally recognized Indian tribe, you can also enroll outside throughout the year uh, in coverage. So there's a variety of ways that p people can come into coverage if they qualify under one of those circumstances. Okay. Thank you. And, and Danette, he may have covered it well, but what, what do small employers need to know about coverage options for their employees or former employees outside of the open enrollment period? Um, yeah, so, so it works a little bit differently for small employers. So as, as, Scott, as Scott kind of explained it, that that's true for the individual market. The small employer market will continue to um, go as, as it does today. So small employers, mid-sized large employers, they have a certain effective date. Um, a, a lot of them are January 1st, but the, throughout the year, uh, employers have effective dates. And so if a, a small employer was interested in looking at shop on the exchange, they can do that uh, really at any time. Small employers can also change their effective date at, at any time that they want and go out to bid again. So there really aren't the limitations for small employers that exist for, for individuals. Hmm, interesting. Dr. Parente, I find this question kind of interesting because now that we have the Affordable Care Act and MNsure and you think, well, that's providing coverage for everyone at any, almost any time, we still have these open enrollments. So why was this open enrollment period included in the Affordable Care Act? In other words, I thought health insurance companies were no longer allowed to deny people health insurance coverage, so why can't everyone apply for coverage year-round? Uh, because you need to have some uh, sense of information in terms of who's actually in your risk pool um, in a secure way. It, it's the type of thing, if you're an actuary, it gives you a little more certainty about knowing who's in your pool at a certain period of time and not for predictability. And predictability allows you to keep your premiums low. So th technically, that's why it's being done. Uh, the reality is that uh, if you wanted to do this uh, so it's better, uh, you need to have better um, data on people um, that would actually be able to sort of front load that stuff at any particular point in time and have essentially the actuaries readjust the tables as they go forward. That might be an option over a period of time, um, but I think this is, this is actually a policy that got put in place in part by Medicare Part D. They, they kind of uh, uh, enforced that for seniors to come on there just to make sure that there was a market for everyone to come out and bid on and get some certainty about as to what they're doing. They would then have time to kind of retreat, recalibrate, figure out premiums for the next year, manage their plans, and come back in. Um, the, the reality, and I used to work for an insurance company before I became an academic. Um, the reality is this is a very exhausting process. I have tremendous, um, not sympathy, but empathy for Danette and a lot of folks that do this. Uh, you're const it's, it's, like a, it's almost like a farming season where there's like, Different seasons bring on different things in terms of what you have to do to plan and get your rates set and look at your actual spend to see where things are going. So there is a, there's a good rationale for it, and it's just a situation where we just don't have actuarial science and the data good enough to do this on a rolling admission basis uh, on a nationwide scale yet. Okay. Other comments, please. 
So just on this, so if I, I guess if this is like a farming season, then ACA is our climate change. So it's it's <laughs> it's a, a little disruptive. A couple things about the open enrollment, though, that 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 I would say, um, open enrollment is 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 really critical because. It's, it's how you get everybody a time certain to get in the risk pool. So I use the example of lot. If you are able to buy uh, home insurance as you're standing outside looking at your house on fire, um, that doesn't work very well. And people only buy the coverage when they need it. You really need to have people buy the coverage when they don't need it or when they think they won't need it because those funds that go into the system help cover the people who you know are, are paying um, you know, $300 a month for coverage, but are on a drug that costs $90,000 a month. So, so you, you know, you, you need to have that. The other piece about open enrollment that, that um, Medica, we've really had a big advertising push at the end. What was really concerning to us is that people didn't understand the consequences of missing the open enrollment period. So everybody heard about, and $95 is what they heard. It's actually 1% of your income or $90 if, if you buy coverage in the individual market and do the math. Those are two different numbers, uh, one being higher. But the other thing that people didn't realize and what we really push is if you don't get coverage during the open enrollment period and you don't meet one of the special enrollment um, opportunities that Scott talked about, you're out. You, you are out of the market for the year, and needing health care coverage is not a qualifying event for getting health care. So I'm still waiting to see what's going to happen when we have a family who comes forward to, to you know, the, the regulators or to the governor's office and says, we missed the open enrollment period, and our child was just diagnosed with cancer, and MSHA, the state's high-risk pool, is closed. So, so one of the things that people really need to understand is, is if you, you know, if you missed that open enrollment period, you don't have access to health coverage until the next open enrollment period. And that, that's a really critical message that I think got missed by the media and, and in, in general was overlooked. Mr. Lights, do you care to comment on open enrollment or? Um, no, uh, I, I think Danette though raises an interesting point, which is that I, uh, we certainly at Minsure tried to stress the message in the last, I would say, week and a half to two weeks of open enrollment that you didn't have an opportunity after open enrollment uh, to come into the market if, unless you qualified for one of these events. And um, I just don't think people fully understand that, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I think uh, it will be interesting to see because I do think those cases will come up and I, and, and I think it's going to be important that we you know, follow what the rules are around this. Okay, well related to that may be this, this question. A great number of folks that enrolled in the MNsure program were, were directed to Minnesota Care and Medicaid, far beyond what was estimated. How does that affect the state of Minnesota Health and Human Services budget? And I'll leave that open to anyone to grab that. I've got some background for that. Yeah, well I'll start with that question and I'll pass it on to the other um, folks on the panel. Um, you know, when we look at data um, from the surveys that the state health department does every, uh, every other year, what those consistently show is that around 60% of the uninsured folks in Minnesota um, are eligible for either Medicaid or our Minnesota Care Program. Uh, we're unique, literally unique in the country um, in running uh, Minnesota Care. At every other state um, eligibility for um, Medicaid runs up to 100 in most states, 100, 133 of poverty, and then everybody else is exchange eligible above that level. We made a decision as a public policy in the state to actually extend Minnesota Care to 200% of poverty, and so the people who enroll in Minnesota Care are actually uh, in Minnesota are actually people in any other state who would be in the exchange and in qualified health plans. And so when you look at the data, you do see that more that you have about 40 some odd thousand people enrolled in Minnesota Care who would be sort of QHP eligible people in every other state. Um, and then you have a lot of folks coming in through the Medicaid program. We have over 100 and some odd thousand, 110,000 or so who came in um, through Medicaid during the um, open enrollment period and, and that continues now throughout the rest of the year. And it's perhaps not surprising though, given where the uninsured are, and now a platform to more easily determine eligibility for them and get them enrolled, that we actually did see much higher numbers than anticipated coming into the Medicaid program. Um, I had a chance to talk with the economist who did the estimates um, around what enrollment would look like um, a couple weeks ago at a conference that I was at, and 
he acknowledged the point that I think that there was some underestimation that occurred around what Medicaid enrollment would look like because I don't think anybody fully understood the effect of the mandate, the effect of um, having a, a more streamlined enrollment platform, and the fact that that's where all the uninsured were. So from a budgetary perspective, um, you know, it has an impact. Um, although med new Medicaid enrollees are, for the first several years, fully federally funded, so we have 100% federal funding to cover the cost of those individuals. Um, I won't get into basic health plan funding and the co complications there since that's a really complex topic, but that might potentially have an impact depending on how, how the federal rules um, end up on that piece. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's actually a pretty good deal for the federal government uh, in the sense of what happened because there hasn't, if people don't go to the exchange and they don't get subsidies and they go through Medicaid, Medicaid at least per capita has a lower spend than what would probably come out through the, the exchange piece of what's happening that way. Um, Minnesota is always sort of an anomaly for exactly the reasons that Scott talks about because of Minnesota care that went in place 20 years ago. Um, it's good that it's actually been maintained. Um, it, there will be an interesting question dynamics wise how it kind of unfolds uh, as the exchange and the other federal subsidies unfold at the same time too. Um, there's Medicaid expansion is still a hot button issue, but probably in this state not. And you know, remember there's over 20 states around the country that decided not to expand Medicaid uh, f after the Supreme Court decision. It's a highly contested issue in those states and remains. It'll probably be a major ballot box issue until it's decided one way or the other. And even then, maybe not, because once you actually just, just because you say you're gonna take the expansion doesn't mean you're gonna necessarily uh, somewhere down the road refuse it because you have some fiscal conservative that comes in and to the state house and says we're going to change our policies. So the fact that Minnesota is stable about this is good on a lot of different reasons. It gives, again, predictability to expenditures. We do have, compared to the rest of the country, a lower spend than other components. We have more integrated care models, which makes Medicaid actually a better care delivery system here than most other places in the country. And, you know, we can probably improve much more on where we are right now. Yeah, the only thing quickly I, I would say about this is, you know, this is really a, a good thing that so many people came on through through Medicaid and Minnesota Care because, as Scott said, 60% of our uninsured in this state are eligible for these programs, and getting them in the program was, was always challenging. Now, w what I would say, and this is water under the bridge, but from a policy standpoint, you know, before the ACA passed, there was a large group of Minnesota um, stakeholders who were trying to lobby in Washington to get some things to be done a little bit differently in Minnesota because if you look at it because of Minnesota care because of our high risk pool the most you know effective high risk pool I, I would argue in the state doesn't mean it's completely effect but 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 it worked very well you know we had an uninsured rate of eight to nine percent the goal of the ACA is an uninsured rate of eight percent and so, you know, we, we've gone through a lot of, of changes and disruption and whatnot. And some could say, you know, Minnesota, we probably could have, you know, still had the plan say, look, you've got to, you know, take all comers. Let's have an open enrollment period. You know, the, the high risk pool, you could use that as a reinsurance mechanism. I mean, there's, there's things I think that we could have done that would have provided all of the benefits and the value of the ACA and maybe not as much of the complexity. But, but again, that's water under the bridge. But every once in a while, it feels good to remind people of our. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you much. In the interest of time, I'm going to open this up so you can participate a little bit if you would like. Questions from the audience at this time. Because it's a small room, we're not going to use a microphone, so we'll ask, we'll start with Mr. Wise here, and we'll go to Ed Oliver. Would you please stand, state your name, and then you can direct it at anyone or just in general. Steve Wise, CAS crew, quick question. Um, given the changing environment, um, mechanisms like HSAs and self-insured plans, what's their life cycle? Well, I... Can we use the microphone? Yeah, I, I'll start with that. Self-insured plan, you know, it's really interesting to see what are employers going to do in all of this. I, I think, you know, as, as, as Stephen alluded to, small employers, we're already starting to see some small employers, particularly if you're a healthy small employer and you're getting hit with a 40% rate increase, you're saying, I'm done. Um, I'll facilitate my employees in the exchanges. But self-insured, interestingly, there's a lot, once again, one of the things that we had really hoped would get helped with the ACA is that they stopped taxing the fully insured 
uh, to pay for all of these things and have it more broad-based to impact the, the self-funded groups through ERISA taxes. And actually, the federal government had the ability to do that. The state does not. They did not. There were some taxes that apply across the board, but really it's still on the backs of fully insured. So actually, self-funding is growing. You're seeing a lot of small employers, mid market uh, em size employers who are going to self-funding uh, to avoid that tax burden. So it's, I, I don't know that that's the best policy ultimately because, you know, that works fine until you get a hemophiliac in your group and now you're upside down. So, but I think self-funded will grow. Yes. So I, I, I'd agree about that self-funding is going to be there. Plus it, it gives you the most flexibility as an employer. And so if you have the wherewithal to cover this, because you really are covering out of your cash reserves and whatever you arrange for reinsurance contracts, if, if you want that flexibility, you're going to keep it. Um, and you, you could have a workforce that wants you to keep that flexibility, too. The HSA question is something I do a lot of research on. Um, actually, there's a study that just got released yesterday that I worked on with some folks from Harvard that shows that uh, you could actually come up with a hybrid HSA or hybrid, hybrid high deductible health plan that would actually cover prevention, secondary prevention for chronic conditions. Because one of the biggest concerns that people have for high deductible health plans is that they, they don't cover much beyond um, now with the ACA rules, uh, there's primary prevention, well child visits, and, and other components. So secondary prevention would be actually covering drug coverage for uh, folks that are diabetic, uh, folks with cardiac conditions at first dollar coverage. So we estimated that that would increase premiums about 5 to 7 percent, so it would make it a more expensive plan. But because you have, because folks with chronically ill con uh, conditions might be able to see the providers they want, and overall, it's much cheaper than a platinum plan or gold. They might flock to it. And we estimated maybe 4 million people nationally might flock to that over a period of time. Uh, that type of thing would sustain and grow the high deductible health plan market more than is already there. It requires an IRS rule change or a legislative change, which is why the study was done. Um, the West Institute funded it. They're sort of an offshoot of U.S. West. But I'm, I'm pretty bullish about this, and just, just because of the, um, the economics of it is pretty simple. Premiums are lower with high deductible health plans. Uh, and even the consumer reaction, when, um, when consumers actually get used to the notion of managing their own funds after the initial cold water treatment of being in an HSA, they tend to like it. Now granted, if, they're in, if they have a chronic uh, illness, it's a major concern. That's why we want to try to change the plans to make them um, more hospitable to that type of um, demographic. Okay, thank you. Former Senator Ed Oliver. Uh, Good question. I, I, I'm going to say the answer to that is largely no, but there were degrees to which the rollouts were rocky, right? So Oregon, for example, on the far end of the spectrum has never enrolled a person through their exchange because the exchange just simply never worked and now they're moving to the federal, the federal exchange. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, there were states like Connecticut that had relatively smooth rollouts. I mean, everybody had a little bit of rockiness. Um, if I was to sort of say, and, and we're somewhere in the middle, I think I saw a report card on us that gave us a B minus uh, yesterday, and I'd say that's probably about right for what we got. Um, the thing that was probably the key uh, in those rollouts was um, selections of vendors that were involved and scope of the product of the of the projects. Um, uh, states that tried to be too ambitious, um, Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, to some degree us, although I think we're. Doing a, going through a process now of scaling back a lot of those things, um, tended to have rockier rollouts than I think states that tried to focus much more on, um, you know, s simpler systems that are more focused on things. I don't know if Steve or yeah, I, I would agree with that, and, and, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm actually really excited that uh, that um, Minsher chose Deloitte to come in, because if you look at some of the states that were more successful, Kentucky is another one I would throw into that, uh, they used Deloitte. And one of the things that Deloitte, my understanding is, was, was adamant about is don't bite off more than you can chew. And, and there was a lot of conversations in the previous, le previous le leadership with Minsher of things that they wanted to do, which were great. But we all knew from a technology standpoint, there's no way you're going to pull that off. And so some desires are initially around billing and, and you know, information on networks. Great consumer experience if you can pull it off. 
And so I, I, I think Scott is absolutely right. I think that scope issue is so critical. Do what you need to do and do it well, and then plan for the future. So. OK, thank you. We're almost up, but I see one more question. Gary Aitken, please. Hi. Uh, yep, that's right. Actually, the, um, the current estimate, and uh, I was reading it bleary-eyed on a plane to D.C. about two days ago, but I think the total estimate came in at about $7 billion for both the federal and the state, and about 40 percent of that went to states. And then I want you to comment on the Mulford marketplace, because one of the things that saved a lot of people, because the thing didn't work, it doesn't work, was the, the businesses. We were so fortunate in our, our state to have a company such as yourself that had excellent websites Yeah, so let me try to quickly, because I know, but the, the, there is still a federal law called EMTALA. Um, I don't know what it stands for, but I know it exists. And, and basically, it does require that, that providers are required to provide health care to, to people who, who need that care. Now, being able to get in for an appointment, it mostly happens through the emergency room, stabilization, et cetera. So, so that exists. So, Gary, you ask, ask a really good question. What is still unknown is what is the uncompensated care going to be for providers? Is it going to go down because more people are insured, or is it going to go up because fewer people are insured or didn't get in the open enrollment? I think that's a... That's an unanswered question, but I will tell you that in this state, I mean, we are really fortunate. We have the, one of the best healthcare systems in the country. We do, you know, the providers are not going to turn their back on, on people who, who, who need the coverage that they need. I mean, we're very fortunate to be in this state. Um, on on the, the private market, you know, I, I appreciate your comments on that. We, we do, and it's interesting when they, you know, all these exchanges started coming up, and we've had it, Medica, and the other plans have it as well. You can shop for all of the products right on. I'm like, i got to brand that thing. Call it an exchange. Well, you know, that's apparently that's the buzzword. But, you know, and, and we did, and I will say that, that I really appreciated with Mincher, um, both Scott and the board chair said, look, go to the private market. I mean, there, you know, we're, it, it's, we've got issues. You need to get coverage. So if that's the best place to get it, you know, they weren't telling people just, you know, screw the private market, come to us, and no matter if you have to wait for whatever you can't get on. So it really was that, that partnership. But, but you're right. There are still, if you, if you are not eligible for a subsidy, you know, you got to question why you want to go to the shop versus the private market. There are products on, on the private market that are not on the shop or that are not on the exchange, but all the products on the exchange are in the private market. So I, I think that that's really the marketplace issue here is if Minsure can provide value, um, and I think they're, they're moving in that direction, people will use it. If not, it will fail, and that's the marketplace making market decisions. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, we can keep going on for this a long time. We're a few minutes late right now, so we'll wrap that up and say a special thanks to our panelists, Annette Coleman from Medica, the U of M <laughs> Steve Parente, and Scott Lights. I want to conclude today's program with just two little announcements. Uh, one, mark your calendars for the Small Business Awards Luncheon coming up on May 15th right here at the Doubletree. As always, for the most up-to-date information, check out our website, twinwest.com. And then the Twin West Political Action Committee is planning the annual PACNIC event for June 18th at the Warehouse Winery in St. Louis Park. If you haven't been there, it's a real fun venue. See Deb or Brad for sponsorship opportunities or tickets. And just want to thank again our Grand Casino uh, Hinkley for their series sponsor and all our other sponsors. So thank you very much. Have a great Friday and weekend. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, we're good there, but I appreciate it.